when we get through Minneapolis, we had this experience. We stop at a diner, we call up our parents, and then we get back on the road. And then the next thing I know is I'm in this sort of construction zone. There's light everywhere. It doesn't make sense. It's sort of like it's sort of like waking up from a blackout and you go like, where am I? What's actually happening? And in that experience, it felt like moving through a world of syrup or thickness or, or different time experience. And then we got to a boundary and pushed through this boundary. And then we were back in normal space. I'm Daniel Rekshan, and this is your superior self. Daniel, my man, thank you so much for taking the time. How are you doing today? How was your sleep? Did you dream it at all last night? I did. Uh, I had a dream. I was in a space with people, and I came to the awareness I was in a dream. I said, oh, my God, I have to wake up right now because I have a podcast in the morning, and I want to make sure I, I watch at least a couple videos of the recent ones. So that was literally the dream, just kind of waking up and out of it. Into, uh, so you, you became lucid and aware that you were dreaming? Just a very, very sliver of it. I went to bed with the intention to, uh, I've been sleeping in recently, but usually I wake up pretty early. So I went to bed with the intention. I said, you know what? No matter what, I just have to wake up at the appropriate time and not wake up my kids next to me. So whatever it takes, dream world, just wake me up. And so oftentimes I work with my own dreams in that way. And I'll ask for solutions to problems or simulations of ideas or creative solutions. And it'll give me a response. And so I did that last night just to wake up on time and be prepped for this. And they gave me this dream experience of, of being in a space. It was nighttime and then going, oh, I'm in a dream. Let's wake up. Yeah, sure. So what I like about your work is uh, I think it's your um, program or, or your baby called DSETI, uh, which you do a lot of research in dreams and contact with the extraterrestrial phenomena. Uh, I like that you put D SETI in there. SETI is the uh, search for uh, extraterrestrial intelligence out in space. However, you're uh, turning that around and going within each one of us and into the dream states, into the uh, altered states of consciousness to, to see where those communications can take place. How did this all start for you, man? Uh, uh, you have a very, I think, I think solid foundation in conventional scientific methods and uh, philosophy. And now we're talking about going into our dream states and having communications with ETs. Uh, so I'm very interested in learning more about you. And I think the audience will as well. Can you just take us down this path, right? Uh, what's your background? Any experiences with the phenomena? And what did that look like? Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I'm offering, I, I do work with uh, the, the experience of the phenomena. That's people with UFO contact, extraterrestrial contact. Uh, psychic or telepathic phenomena. And um, I got into it um, by way of my background. I mean, I, I have a master's degree in psychology, a bachelor's degree in philosophy. Um, I have a certificate in hypnotherapy. The reason why I got into all of these things was when I was a kid, I was fascinated with the world and um, the deeper truth. So I was really interested in the truths that science could offer but also the truths that religion could offer. Um, and so that really compelled me forward. I also had a lot of potent dream experiences. So that's like sleep paralysis or lucid dream experience or entity encounters where it feels like something's really visiting in the dream. And those really compelled me to study what other people experience and put me on this path to, to really understand what's possible. Um, so those those experiences of and I would say those dreams I had when I was a teenager or so, which I wasn't sure was it an abduction event because that's what some of the information said was it just a dream and how can I figure that out and that really compelled my path forward and I went to school I studied uh, philosophy of science I, I I looked into these different things in order to make sense of that for me. And so I've sort of come to an understanding that it's both a dream and a real event. And so that's why I'm, I'm writing books and talking about it, because I, I found some peace and insight about those early experiences that were challenging from my dream 
my dream life when I was a teen where, where I go, I don't know if this is real or not. I don't know if people are abducting me or not. I don't know what's happening. And I, I went through that journey, figured some things out and say, okay, now I'll, I'll start speaking about it. Mm -hmm. That's so fascinating. Well, there is a an aspect of that that seems dreamlike. I feel like a lot of the individuals have had have had those abduction experiences. I can't speak to it because I never had. I, I don't think I've had one. Maybe I have, but it, it, they always say it seems dreamlike. And I think you've had an experience with your brother, correct? Uh, like with the phenomenon. Absolutely, yeah. So this is one of the events I keep coming back to that really compels me forward to say it's both a dreamlike experience and something very, very real. When we were, my brother and I were twin brothers. We were about 19 years old. We were on a road trip from Michigan to California to see the redwood trees. And <clears throat> when we get through Minneapolis, we had this experience. We stop at a diner, we call up our parents, and then we get back on the road. And then the next thing I know is I'm in this sort of construction zone. There's light everywhere. It doesn't make sense. It's sort of like, it's sort of like waking up from a blackout and go like, where am I? What's actually happening? What happened before? I'm not really sure what's even happening now. And in that experience, we uh, had, it was a very, very strange experience. It felt like moving through a world of syrup or thickness or, or different time experience. And then we got to a boundary and pushed through this boundary. And then we were back in normal space. And we pulled off to the side of the road out of rest area. And it was like, what happened? And we, we became convinced that we got drugged somehow through LSD on the payphone in the diner, maybe through like an MK Ultra thing, which didn't make any sense. That explanation didn't make any sense. We've both done LSD and know what that's like. And so it doesn't make sense, but that really made, that's really what my our rational mind said. That, yeah, that made sense. And we didn't talk about it for 10, 20 years until a client who had the same name as the city my twin brother was living in said, hey, I had this experience. I, I was outside of a major city that described similar type experiences and seeing a strange dog as well. My brother reported seeing a dog slash witch at the boundary. So those kind of events made me go, something's actually happening here. And I, I called my brother and I asked him just sort of, what do you remember about driving outside of Minneapolis? And he was able to tell me the same story, more or less that my client told me that triggered my memory. So I, if, if my brother didn't have that memory, I would have gone, oh, okay, I'm just projecting on what a client told me. Cause I go, wow, this triggers a whole thing that I never even thought about I mean, it, it was there, but I never thought about it. And so that, that I would say is a kind of a stereotypical example of what people call abduction or like when people have, have said abduction, they, they, there's these events, they're not fully explained. They're maybe like a dream, but if we add it all together, there's a picture here. And what's that picture? Well, the abduction researchers say abduction. I say something different, but I say that we're, we're starting at a very similar place. Mm -hmm. But what are you saying about that? Um, so I'm saying I'm not 100% sure, but I know it's it's a dreamlike experience because I've talked to my brother in terms of his experience there. I've talked to this client who had a similar experience. I've gone through my own experience. I went through a regression hypnosis to figure that out. That ended up not necessarily adding any memory to this situation, but rather it's sort of a telepathic contact or a kind of insight came forward in that experience. Um, and for me, the understanding is that this is going to get really complex really fast. Sure. Um, but there is a sort of non-human intelligence in the world that sort of acts through um, this kind of mystical way, let's say this sort of, uh, I, I say as a dream shamanic way, I say they behave in the same way that dream shamans behave. So if someone's out of body, right? Like you talk to Tom Campbell a lot, right? They're out of body. They have certain capacities out of body. They can interact in certain ways with the world. And if we did enough science, we'd understand how that out of body double could act in the world. So I say, hey, this looks like someone doing that to, to us, taking over the mind, putting us in trance so that we can drive just fine, right? We're, the understanding was we weren't teleported. We were just driving. It was it was an experience of the mind, something like a daydream, 
but the daydream was so real and what the, the nature of that was caused by something else. That's what I'm saying. And that something else looks like a conscious being who is skilled at something like out of body projection or dream shamanism or something like that, which explains a lot of the abduction experiences where people talk about, well, I saw this big owl that turned out to be an alien or they, yeah. So there's always these elements of consciousness in these abduction experiences that make you go, oh, there's, it's like normal, but somewhat different. And so where is that difference coming from? Who's creating that experience? And I'm saying it's, it's the non-human intelligence that may be something like the higher self or something. We, we still have to have that conversation, but um, that's, that's kind of what I'm, that I understood in my experience with my brother. Um, so I became less afraid of alien abduction and more interested in going, oh, what are the capacities that I can experience of my own consciousness that could give me insight about how this experience was even possible? Wow. There's so many questions, man. Um, mm, so the, after this experience, right, did this catapult you or catal catalyze the, the curiosity in trying to understand more about how you had this experience like i know you, we talk about tom tom campbell did that send you down that road of trying to understand how i can access these different states of altered consciousness to have another experience because i feel like what you're describing to me is like yes you're you're 100 right in that uh, people drive down the road and they have missing time and they daydream and they go somewhere else. But yes, subconsciously we're so we, we're so programmed to operate a car. We can do that without consciously being there. I do it all the time. I have a very long commute. There are times where I start daydreaming and I'm in a different locale. I'm in a different dimension. Like I'm, I'm daydreaming about something and then I come back and I'm like, Oh, where did I come? Where, where, where did the time go? I'm, I'm here already. So, that to me is a good example of missing time. However, there's a, it seems like there's a high correlation between alien, alien ET abductions and missing time or experiencers, right? Like listening to Diana Pasolka and her new book encounters, it seems like a lot of people experience missing time as a, as a factor in that experience. Um, do you think that maybe, they're stepping into a different dimension almost like Betty and Barney Hill. Like those, those two uh, individuals have a, an amazing experience and it's like, how do they both do that? Like, I just feel like, and William Buhlman um, talks about how all of this phenomenon is just an out of body experience. So do you think, and, and, and I think what, what's his name? Um, Jacques Vallée says he doesn't believe that this, well, I'm not putting words into his mouth and I don't want to project onto him. But the way that I understand some of his literature is that a lot of this, uh, the, a lot of these experiences are interdimensional as opposed to extraterrestrial. So, um, what are your thoughts on that? Like, what is it, what is the mechanism that is triggering us to step into a different dimension? Is it in the brain or is it like, to your point, like, uh, an experience that's been cultivated by the higher self? I love that. I love that question. Uh, I think about that a lot. I would totally agree in, in terms of the interdimensional hypothesis or going to a different dimension. The understanding I would put forward here is that with dreams, like our, our kind of like everyday understanding of dreams in everyday Western culture, we're like, dreams are meaningless. That doesn't matter. It's just a dream, that sort of thing. But then the shamanic and indigenous cultures and even Western culture at the beginning says, hey, dreams are very meaningful. And it sort of looks like your soul goes traveling at night and comes back and it has interactions. And so I, I would say that we have an example of sort of extra dimensional or interdimensional communication and travel in dreams kind of naturally. And so the that's the thing I'm, I'm saying is that um, if we had more experience with dreams as a kind of soul voyage at night, then we would go, oh, they're doing something similar is happening in the UFO encounter, except that the context isn't necessarily nocturnal dreams. It's waking phase, uh, like everyday consciousness, but somehow it, it activates the same, same pathway. 
The reason why I say it's really relevant is because of the missing time factor. You pointed to how a lot of these experiences have missing time associated with it. And the example I think of, the best example of missing time I think of is every night everyone has about three to four dreams and they don't remember a lot of them. Like tonight, I only have this snippet, but I know I was dreaming a lot more. I had so much more experience, but I don't have any memory of it. Weird things happen in that dream, but there's no real memory of it. And I go, there's something that happened. I just can't tell you what that is. And so that's very similar to me in terms of the the stuff like Jacques Vallée describes or Pasolka. That's, that's like, and, and so I, I say that it is something like interdimensional travel, but that we, if we understood how to dream, like shaman's dream, then we would understand how to how those beings come into this world and how we might communicate through that. And that's a process I'm just beginning. Um, yeah. That's awesome, man. It's funny how we, 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 they call it non-human intelligence, right? And like silly us to think that we're the only intelligence in this cosmos, right? Like if a cow, like, don't you think if a cow could paint, they would draw God as a cow, right? So you think about us and that we, we automatically think that God is human. Right. Yeah. So we receive information that is that is uh, and which can be interpreted any way because communication isn't just verbal. Right. Like when you have these messages or downloads like you're un you don't understand where they're coming from. But to your point again earlier about uh, this intelligence, there's this intelligence that is in the universe that is, I think, in my personal experience, guiding us to evolve, which I I totally resonate with that. Tom Campbell talks about that, lo lowering our entropy and having a better quality of choice in the moments of our lives. I feel like I want to connect more with that energy. Like if you want to call it God, you want if you want to call it the larger consciousness system, whatever, I want to be able to connect with that. And I feel like uh, I'm on the verge of like creating protocols in my life. But have you, Daniel, ever created a set of protocols where you've been able to uh, connect with that intelligence more to receive downloads or receive guidance that helps you in your research, that helps you push you down your path, to help you understand more of what's going on. Because I feel like there's a lot of confusion and we always look externally for the solutions. Like we're always looking, you know, as a scientist, we're going to look at the literature and see what that says. But personally, man, it, it seems like to me, yeah, we, we rely heavily as scientists on the literature. But yet that can be problematic because how much is that how much is that literature is redacted, right? Like how much are the scientists not really putting in a lot of the information because they're afraid of not being published or something? You know what I mean? How much of that literature, and I'm just, you know, I'm going on a rant here, uh, has been accurately re replicated. And uh, the information we're seeing is like the pure information, which there's a lot of, I don't know. I'm not going to go down that. I, I was, but I'm not. Um, for you. How do you guide yourself in connecting more with that intelligence? And do you have a set of protocols or, or practicalities that you implement like over your course of your evolution? Yeah, the, the protocols are essential, I would say. Um, I mean, that this a subject of one of my books is the Book of Galactic Light, which is an exploration of a really advanced protocol from the history of... Um, like Western history. So in the 16th century, there's a man named Dr. John Dee who advised Queen Elizabeth of England about how to colonize the new world, how to establish the British empire and how to talk to angels that seem like they're extraterrestrials when we look back at them. So I looked at his protocols and I, I did something similar to have a communication with intelligences. And I transcribed that into this book, the Book of Galactic Light. And that's the most advanced protocol I've ever done. I've done things like out-of-body experience protocols. I do meditation. But the fundamental protocol I use is, is called dream incubation. So we talked a little bit about it, about setting it up for uh, waking up at the right time. But the dream incubation is really about using dreams as a way to connect with that higher self or all that is or the wisdom of the world. And really all that is is a process of, there's there's a bit of a process to it and I'd recommend a process of, it's like purification. So there's a sense of, of cleaning the body or mind. So sometimes burning sage, sometimes I'll take a sauna or a bath and then establishing a sense of intention 
or supplication. And so I go to bed going, I want to have a dream about that will heal me, or I want a dream that will guide my next action. And what ends up happening in my research, I, I, I get really interested in specific topics and I have dreams about those topics. And so I'll go to bed with that in my heart and mind is this openness to the dream world, providing insight and creative solutions. And then I'll have a dream that directly responds to it. Or a lot of the time now, I will literally just wake up at three to 5 a.m. and move directly into writing or research from the dream state that has a lot of communication in it for me. So that's how I work with it. Mm. Uh, that's so, so you're setting an intention before you go to bed and you're stating what you, you're, you know, putting that into your heart, that intention of wanting, you know, what kind of experience you want to have. Yeah. I've, I've heard of this before, like setting that intention and stating dream, please show me, you know, what is possibly, you know, um, hanging me up from achieving X, Y, and Z, right? Like show me the way. But a lot of that is metaphorical, right? Like a lot of our dreams are metaphorical. Like they're, we want to interpret it like as literal, like the, this is the way, but I feel like a lot of my dreams are metaphorical and that it will, it will show me something, a death or some type of relationship. I mean, and sometimes even like a sexual dream, but I'll, I'm like thinking like, what am, why am I having these dreams about sex? It's like, and then someone will say, well, it's about integrating that person into your, uh, into your I don't know, energy or into your reality. So that way you can kind of bring forth that into whatever you're trying to create or try to, to heal. And so like, are your dreams, like when you're having these experiences, are they literal or do you find they're metaphorical and do you have to like totally like analyze them from a psychological standpoint, like a, a framework to, to truly understand like a, like young would do like, you know what I mean? Like how he, he definitely um, analyzes dreams from a different perspective outside the box thinking, is that something similar to what, how you handle um, dream interpretation? Yeah. I, I mean, I love young in his dream interpretations. I, I, I read his works and have in the past and, and he's been really inspiring to me how I, I mean, part of working with any dream is the process of interpretation. And that's personally is and culturally specific to everyone. So it's like how you interpret your dreams is different than how young would. And that's totally fine. Like young had his own situation and we can be inspired by it, but you can turn to your own symbols and things like that to understand your dreams. Um, I go through that process of interpretation with some of the dreams that respond to my incubations, but sometimes I, uh, this is not, it's not a symbolic communication. It's a direct communication. I might feel as if, right, there's a, a visitation, a communication from a dream character. And sometimes it's just, um, when I get really into research and things like that, it's literally just dreams of like white light. Uh, that sort of feels like a white noise kind of machine with like static or whatever, just amped up. And it's like, and then from there, I wake up pretty early, like at that time between like three and five is this, this kind of really quiet moment, sacred moment of the night. And then from there, I directly take action. And so that is a different way of working with dreams that I've done before, which is taking action on the dream in ways that feel reasonable. And it took me um, a little bit of time to build that relationship with my dreams where I would incubate a dream, I'd have a dream, but rather than interpret it from this whole complex kind of psychological perspective, I go, what do I, what action do I need to take? What sort of creativity do I need to take that directly expresses the spirit of that dream? And that might be just making art. And I might not ever know that it's talking about my mom or dad or whatever. And I just make art on it. And that connection between dream incubation, the dreams and the actions closed the circuit. And so a lot of my books actually have been written kind of more or less directly like that. Um, it's straight from the straight from dreaming mm -hmm. how do you distinguish right from these special dreams these cool dreams and then like a normal dream um the <laughs> that's a really good question everyone has their own cues so for me it's feeling so for me it's feeling and how i'm perceiving so um in sort of these normal little dreams where i'm in mean, like maybe it's wish fulfillment maybe i'm processing stuff i'm pretty much embodied in something that seems like a human body but then when I'm navigating in the world and I'm talking to people in the dream, 
right? They're not using their, their words like this. I just get a sense of it. And it, it's, it's pretty much like an 80% render of a world. Um, and then, and sometimes the special dreams, I don't have any body whatsoever. I'm, I'm just this perspective where I'm localized, I'm looking out, but I also can feel everything. Like I'm, I'm 20% the whole space. And I get that, or there's a feeling of a presence there. And so I, I'm really working by the different clusters of feelings. Everyone has different feelings that clue them in. That's one of the things when I work with people and I do dream dream work with people, I explore how they perceive things. So one of the things that has been really hard for me as a uh, as a person working with other people is, learning how they, they perceive it, especially people with body stuff, right? They Sometimes people perceive so much truth and detail through just, just different energies in the body. And so it's a really unique experience that everyone has to build up to go, how am I perceiving this? But for me, it's really just, what's the feeling? Where's my, how's my perception active in that world? I love that. How would you define communication then, right? Because everyone thinks that communication is what we're doing right now, but like what, how would you help someone understand what communication could be? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, like, that's a good question, right? Like that's that ties into thinking about, um, like for me, the sense of uh, working with other people with like hypnosis, right? So hypnosis in service to missing time. So people who have been abducted or have missing time often see a hypnotist and the hypnotist will ask them questions. They'll use their words to ask questions like, what happens next, go back to the time that you saw the light, what happens next, that sort of thing. And so there's a verbal communication happening between people. But then I say there's also this nonverbal communication happening where there's these expectations, there's emotions in the room, there's all these things that can influence that experience as it unfolds. And so for me, I try to pay attention to what's happening emotionally, what's happening mentally, spiritually, and in the body. And there's much more, especially in dreams, this is kind of confusing because the whole notion of using dreams as a communication with extraterrestrials is it communicates through your direct experience of yourself in your dream world. So you have to do some interpretation. Um, so that's a kind of a vague answer to your question about communication. I'd love to see where you want to go with that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, I think just with the, the wide spectrum of people that I talk to on the show, right? It's especially near death experiencers, uh, when they have a, that death experience, they have this, this, it seems dreamlike to them as well. It seems like they, they have missing time. They have this communication with a, with a being, a light being, and then they come back and they come to find out they've been in a coma for a month. Right. Uh, but it seems like uh, only a, a, a short time on the other side and in the non-physical and they receive all this information, colors, uh, tastes, um, s sensations, um, downloads, full understanding of the universe and why they're here. And then they come back and they lose all of that. Right. So it's always it's always made me curious to why. Like, why is it when they have these experiences or anyone has these experiences? It's like they have this full understanding of, you know, they see the sacred geometry. They see the matrix for what it is. And then they come back and it's like who am I? Like, they totally forget, right? Like, I don't know if it's something with the brain or a mechanism in the brain, or maybe like this, if we are these energetic bodies outside of this physical body, like maybe it's like the, the, the squeezing into this, this reality that really, you know, takes so much energy and concentration for that higher self that it just, it, it that's a, uh, by default, that's a, a side effect of that. But to remember, right, what Plato talks about, you know, the soul knows everything, right? Like that's essentially what he says. And it's a process of remembering. Um, do you think these experiences are like trying to show us like, like this isn't who you are? Like this reality is not what you think it is. This is something totally different. There's something larger going on. We're trying to get your attention, man. Just focus for a minute here, right? Like look at these experiences, what we're trying to tell you and uh, wake up, right? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think in terms of remembering, I think that's right on the sense that there's a lot more happening in that we are in this process of forgetting and remembering the experiences in like the, 
like the big experiences, like the alien encounters or near death experiences or ghost encounters or things like that. I think in part they can serve, there's so many different purposes for them and it's hard to say just one, but I think in general, we can say that they do wake us up to the fact that something else is happening. Um, and I often think a lot about lucid dreaming as an example. So in lucid dreaming, you become aware of the fact you're dreaming. And how do people become aware of the fact they're dreaming? Well, sometimes it happens naturally. Sometimes they dr have a dream incubation. They go to bed thinking, I want to be lucid. Um, and then sometimes things that normally would be impossible happen and you actually catch that. So you realize you're flying, you realize you go through the wall, or you realize there's a fantastic creature with you and that shouldn't be happening in waking phase and therefore you must be dreaming. And so, and then that sense of therefore I must be dreaming allows you to wake up to the fact that you're dreaming in the dream and then opens you up to this whole possibility of being lucid, of encountering deeper wisdom. And I think the same thing's happening with the near death or the angel encounters or the aliens or poltergeists is like, these are weird things happening out, out in normal life that shouldn't be happening. And you go, how is this possible? And so just like in the lucid dream that kind of invites you to realize what's happening in the dream, these angel encounters or alien encounters go like, wake up, figure out what's happening in this phase. How is it even possible that angels or near death can happen in that that kind of invites us to remember more. Sure. What are some of the misconceptions about those communications, right? Like, what is it that I feel like Hollywood paints a, a certain picture of abductions and poltergeists and things of that nature. And, and trust me, I've, I've read a lot of dark stuff uh, just from someone's interpretation of uh, the greys or uh, some type of alien communication. But what is the overarching, like, you know, similarities or um, uh, main threads that are, are involved or I guess correlated with the, with the experiences. Yeah. Um, uh, the misconceptions around the experience um, are that it's negative and that you can't do anything about it. That's why I'm talking about the UFO abduction syndrome. That's why I'm talking about how it's dreamlike. That's why I'm talking about hypnosis. And, and it's sort of like why I decided to go into PhD research in this because I think there's a lot of misconceptions and it's disempowering. So it, when I when I just look through the literature from the 1990s around alien abduction, I say, wow, it, the, the story that people are telling about it is that you're a victim, you're disempowered, there's nothing you can do about it. We, we don't even know why it's happening sort of thing. And But there has been some surveys of experiencers and there's more information about it. And it looks like the experiences are not all negative. They're not all terrifying. The more experiences someone has, the less afraid of them they are, the more they realize it's some sort of spiritual teacher. So it makes me think, oh, this is not as disempowering. It's not as victimizing as we would expect. And so that's why I'm doing a lot of the research to understand how did we understand even what alien abduction is and what ET contact is um, and how communication even happens? So I go, how did we actually understand that from the 80s and 90s onwards? And why do we think it's so dreamlike and why do we think it's not a dream? And so I'm trying to figure out all those questions so that I can really say this is dreamlike and therefore you're empowered to choose how you want to relate to it. If you want to choose to continue to be a victim, that's your choice. If you want to choose a different path, that's up to you. Just in the same way that we might have recurrent nightmares of scary beings coming to us that sometimes even have these sort of physical effects of like, you can't breathe or there's marks on the body or you might be in a different position. This happens with ghost stuff and alien stuff. All of those things are kind of give you a sense of, oh my God, like what's even happening? How do I handle this? Like, is this like that scary movies or not? But the, the misconception is like, the it's pushing away your role as a participant and a co-creator of it. Even though it's scary, we make a lot of scary nightmares for ourselves in life and in dream. And so this is just one of those that we have the power to work with should we choose to. Sure. I think Tom Campbell would say that it's an, an, an opportunity for you to eliminate fear. 
right? Like we're creating, we're co-creating this experience, even though it could be like a crazy looking monster or some type of, I don't know, vampire or whatever, but it's ultimately trying to get you to show or help you learn that you're more than your physical body and, and to eliminate that fear and to realize who you are. Um, I think that's fascinating. Have you ever had any, I mean, have you had any similar experiences to where it was kind of dark or like, you know, frightening? I uh, about half the experiences are dark and frightening. Uh, to be honest, it's like it's like a lot of my experience have been positive and transcendent, but a lot of them, I wake up with my heart pounding and going, "What just happened?" <laughs> like like it has a physical feeling to it. Like it's like you know that feeling of of like in the guts, there's a sort of like biochemical release in this sort of like fear that makes this like sweat in your armpits that's like really gross or whatever. Like that's the experience I have waking up from a number of these experiences that were really set me on my path, let's say. Um, and those were the experiences that I needed years to just go, oh, this wasn't some some space alien zapping me. Like I, th the body itself and dreams themselves are so potent they can produce those experiences. I needed to figure that out. Um, yeah. So what was that for you? Like what was that getting zapped by something? <laughs> like what was is that metaphorical for something? Oh, uh, <laughs> it, back when I was doing like a lot of out of body dream research and stuff like that. Oh, so much weird stuff ended up happening, and in part it was because of. Uh, Tom Campbell's inspiration, right? He says, if you don't believe what I'm saying, just try it. And so I went out and I tried a lot of the out of body techniques and there were, you know, you, you'd you feel beings in the room, you'd feel these energy. I would feel these energies sort of happening like walls of energy or it's just sort of like, well, it's, it's almost similar to like being splashed with water, that kind of thing. That, that, that's the sort of how my, my, my body mind interpreted it. And there's a lot of, when, when I started researching this and experiencing this, there's a lot of these different experiences that are really sort of disconnected. It's like, why am I experiencing all these sense of vibration? What is this kind of electric feeling? How come I'm interacting with beings in this dream realm and all these different, inf it's just coming in in so many different ways. And so, um, having a reading about what out of body experiences is or what near death experiences and reading just a lot of these different stories go oh there's something kind of common amongst those experiences that helped me go huh there's a greater story than just my crazy experiences of like of like the the scary thing in the corner or waking up and being paralyzed and going like how come i can't move that sort of thing yeah wow so have you had a classical out-of-body experience the way that Robert Monroe discusses or talks about? Uh, yeah, I did some of his techniques. I did the gateway techniques. Um, so I ended up having a handful of sort of like consciously induced out-of-body experiences. And I had a lot more dream experiences where I'm like, I'm in the dream world. I'm transitioning from lucid dream to out-of-body. It's really hard to tell. Am I dreaming this or is it a real out-of-body experience? Um, and I say there's really not that much different in my experience, um, but I did have a couple, you know, he, he talks about this sense of uh, rolling, imagining yourself rolling out of body that never worked for me. But there's another guy who says you imagine yourself pulling yourself up and out and you do it at these specific angles. And that really worked for me. Um, so I don't do that practice anymore because it's energetically intense and it takes some time to really set up. I, I supported that with a, like a sitting meditation practice. I did a lot of dream journaling. I did a lot of work to really be in sort of peak physical condition or mental condition to like go on that journey. And I'm with kids and everything. It's really hard to. Oh, I know brother. <laughs> I know, man, but that's the, that's the journey, right? I feel like yeah. if it was easy, like it wouldn't be as worth, it wouldn't be worth it really. I don't know. Maybe it is easy for some, but maybe, I don't know. Maybe, some people will say well, I've done so much past work life or regression therapy that I've, I was a monk in, you know, 1500s. And now I, I, because of that work now I'm able to tap into that. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Um, that's your experience. But what's interesting to me is that you've definitely helped with um, your experience through regression therapy. 
And the, I've looked at the research a little bit, right? And and the, and the scientists would say, uh, you're you're basically messing with like false memories, right? Like you're implanting those memories into into the subconscious. What are your thoughts on that? Oh yeah, thanks for bringing that question up. I think anyone who touches this topic needs to ask those questions very very deeply. Um, I look. So one of the things that um, I was challenged to in my PhD program was to look at the skeptical literature. So don't just look at the literature that says these things are real. Look at the skeptical literature. So I've been reading the skeptical literature about false memories and things like that. Um, I think that uh, is a, a very deep concern. Uh, false memories arising from hypnosis, especially regarding alien abduction, uh, is problematic. My whole um, idea, the idea that caused me to write these books, is that the missing time experience is dreamlike and the regression hypnosis experience actually may be shamanic dream work. So rather than think of it like memory retrieval where there's all these pro problematic stuff, I say that the regression experience, the regression hypnosis experience is actually shamanic dream work in that we have, it's natural that we, that we as a people, humans, do this naturally. We work with our dreams or dreamlike experiences in that way. And that it only becomes problematic for culture and science if we understand it as a means of memory retrieval. We go, okay, this experience that looks like a dream, and science really does say that hypnosis produces a state of consciousness that's something like a something like a, a nap, something like a daydream. It's very similar to dream experiences. So, and there's been studies that go, <laughs> are the experiences in hypnosis similar to dreams? And they go, yes, it is. And there's a spectrum between hip, uh, like trance experiences, daydreams, nocturnal dreams, and things like that. So I say, it's all a dream type thing. So if we work with it in the regression experience, as if it were a dream, with the understanding that dreams are real, and bring us into real interactions with real beings, but they all require interpretation. I say then, then we avoid all of the problems of like false memory if we treat it like a shamanic experience. Sure. So Tom Campbell says that dreams are a one player game, right? Like you're the one creating the, the dream experience. This reality is a multiplayer game. So I guess when you're having these experiences with the phenomenon, like, is that going from a one player game back to a multiplayer game? Like, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, I would question that sense of one player game and, and, uh, the dreams. And I would say at some levels, yes, absolutely. It's we, the first layer of experience with dreams is always that sort of one player. Like it's, it's your personal imagination. Like you dream of, some object, even an apple or a table or whatever, your table and apple is different than my table and apple. And that has a whole different rich set of associations for you versus me, even though they're the same thing. So there's at that level, you are dealing with a very kind of one player experience. But we, if you go down a couple levels in the dream experience, or if like I look to dream shamans, I look to like the Tibetan yogas of sleep and dream um, that tell me that these cultures believe something else is happening. And so they say you, you, you actually have to interpret the dream at a personal level, but there's something else happening below that. And that can be kind of revelation of, of um, it can give you information, right? Like precognitive information can give you information that's healing, can give you information that's guiding. There may be personal communications, right? Shared dreams. There may, There is a lot of evidence for dream telepathy. And that's one of the things I point to in my in the science, right? There's meta-analysis, meaning that's the highest level of scientific standard we have that have looked at multiple studies related to dream telepathy that show humans can send images to each other while in dreamscape. They're not very good at it. And it's not like a fax or whatever, but the the fact is, it, it really there seems to be an effect that something does come through, and so that tells me it at one level it's a one player game, at another level it's a multiplayer game, and so that's where I'm really interested in the communication factor, or, or is how how can we figure out 
how can we talk about these experiences together? Like I had these experiences. They're not meaningful to anyone until I can interpret and make meaning out of them in a way that connects with another person. So that's the kind of inquiry I'm on now. Mm -hmm. How do you interpret that for yourself though, right? Like that's, I think that's the toughest part. We always go external, like, hey, Daniel, man, I had this dream last night that I was doing X, Y, and Z. Can you interpret it for me? Do you, um, I mean, how do you personally interpret that for yourself? Yeah, I mean, I talk to people about my dreams, like my wife, we talk about. So this, this sense of talking about the dream helps. Um, I also do a lot of writing about it. I go into trance states to understand um, the best thing I say from my experience is not needing a final interpretation, right? So, so this, this is a, this is like a trick that meditation helps with because meditation helps you practice being in this state where it's, it's, you, you're having these thoughts come up, but you're not engaging with them and you're not, you don't, you're practicing not thinking them to conclusion, right? Like, oh, I'm anxious about tomorrow or I'm thinking about the past. Right? These thoughts come up in meditation and you just let them and you let them go instead of going like, oh, how can I solve the thing about tomorrow or how can I address the regret I have about yesterday? So it gives you practice being in this sort of non-attached point of view. And the, the clue for me with dreams or the insight I have is that there's no final state of interpretation. Um, and so the sense of will I ever know if the dream I had when I was 16 about a reptilian being who ate me alive underneath these stars, was that an actual abduction experience or was that a just a personal dream or was it a personal dream and there was like dream telepathy underneath it? Which was it? And it's like, I'll never actually know 100%. And my ego hates that. And it requires a lot of, kind of practice to go, I'll never know. But the journey of engaging with it is a sort of meaningful protocol, let's say, that does produce insight and it does produce empathy with other people and it does help these sort of communications unfold, but we'll never get to that sense of, yeah, it's definitely, I'm definitely an abductee because of this dream or whatever. We'll no, I, I'll not get there, I think. Yeah, but you can say that about anything, right? Like you can tell anyone that unless you have somebody there with you. You know, like the Chris Bledsoe story, you know, like uh, he talks about that experience and how he lost like four hours of, of his uh, time and came back and had this amazing experience. And then no one's going to believe you anyway. Right? I, I was abducted, abducted. And they're like, no, you weren't, man. Like, where were you really? You know, you were, you know, um, which, again, I find it so fascinating because like he talked about how this orb took him to like different different countries and showed him different things and and. Um, again, brought him back. And then he, how do you integrate that information into your life? Because he came out from a very dogmatic religion and basically was ostracized from his community and no one believed him, but his family and he, he lost everything essentially. And, uh, I don't, I, I feel like there's so many commonalities that, that people can relate to in that story where they've experienced something totally amazing outside of their, their paradigm that shifted and to your point about uh, ontological shock or existential shock, um, they feel like they can't go to anyone to, to speak about this. So a lot of the abduction reports or experience reports aren't really filed because of the fear that's associated with actually making the report and having to talk about it at Thanksgiving dinner with Uncle Joe, who basically says you're crazy and you need to get locked up. How do you encourage people that have had experiences like that are similar to Chris Bledsoe or yourself? How do you kind of how do you encourage them to talk about it? Yeah, um, like a dream. I, I encourage people to talk about it like a dream, meaning uh, they have a, it's a certain sacredness about the testimony we're sharing. Um, that's some of the work I'm doing in my research is trying to figure out insights from how people share their religious or spiritual testimonies. How can we bring that to talk about the phenomena and experience of the phenomena? Um, one of the things that I would love to see our culture do or society do is separate our understanding of uh, like the experience, the lived experience, like Chris Bledsoe has this really rich story. He, and if you go back and look at it, you, he talks about seeing orbs. He talks about seeing little beings. He talks about all these experiences. And then there's a sort of 
understanding or conclusion there, oh, these are aliens or, oh, this is the, the mother or the lady or whatever. Or, and so there's this jump that I think most people aren't comfortable with, but the sense of actually going, this is something unexplained. I have these experiences. Everyone has weird experiences they can't explain. And the, in, in that sense of being able to share your experience, I would, I would, I'd, Love to have that separate from the conversation about what those mean, right? So we can we can share the experiences and then have a conversation about what it means. And I think a lot about abduction in this case because you go back to the early 1990s abduction researchers and look at their cases. Their cases are very much like people have these sort of dreamlike experiences. They don't know what they mean. It's not very clear cut that is aliens or it could be interdimensional it could be angels it could be demons but the abduction research say no 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 it's definitely aliens and so that that sense of saying no 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 it's definitely this is what causes that sort of pushback i think from society so i encourage people to really find safe ways to talk to each other about their lived experience without necessarily jumping to conclusions or holding those conclusions very, very tightly. Sure. They can just email you, right? <laughs> and, and talk to you. Um, but to your point, I think it's very important to realize how much of your intake of um, just our reality here uh, leaks into our subconscious, like uh, the media, the, the the information data that you intake is social media, uh, TV shows, Netflix, all of that is influencing your subconscious. So, so the phenomena may come and show itself as something that you're totally you know, subconscious to like you know what i mean like the aliens like who says that the alien has to look like the way that hollywood depicts it right like it could be something totally different outside of the realm of, of possibility because uh, i feel like i feel like it's influencing us like the flying saucer um valet talks about that right like um was it the, the 1945 crash or, or wherever is you know that started showing like flying saucers and things happening right um and maybe it's because something in our history you know something a movie or some book or something influenced us and subconsciously maybe collectively to project that image out into uh this reality to for us to experience it so we could we could relate to it as something that is outside the norm and to really take that message more seriously or to wake us up because we interpret that as oh this is not normal right like uh, this is totally outside the realm of, of possibility for, for my paradigm. What is going on here? I don't know, but I think it's important that people to me, for me personally, I, I started really cleansing myself of what I'm watching of like what I'm paying attention to, because I feel like there's a fight for our attention. And when we, when we feed that, right? Like you don't know what you're subconsciously picking up, right? Even for kids. I mean, their brains are so malleable up to the age of seven. Right. And then you, but put a pad in front of them and who really knows what the message is that they're getting from watching like Disney junior or something like that. Right. Um, it could affect the reality at some point. I mean, it's something to take note of. What are your thoughts? Oh, absolutely. Um, I pay attention to a lot of to people's stories. Um, and this is a very, very common story of people having dreamlike experiences of little people in their room associated with sleep paralysis. And then they, they don't know what happened they like they can't make sense of it until they they go to a bookstore and they see Whitley Strieber's communion with the, the gray on the cover and they go, oh, my God, that was those little guys in my room. Somebody else had that experience. Right. But there in terms of what we know of false memory and stuff like that, there's there's very much it, it very much could be a subconscious thing, a projection thing. It's like we know the memories aren't stable in that way. So there's this whole dynamic between culture, unconscious, and, and all of that, that we have to start to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. um, Betty and Barney Hill are a really great example. They're a very famous early case of abduction. They're like the famous case. And in terms, in their case, they, involved, they, they saw UFO, they had these sort of experiences, they had dreams that come up, and then they talked to a hypnotist to help understand what those experiences were. But even nine days before the hypnotist, there was a TV show or whatever, The Outer Limits, that showed this sort of alien. And then they, then they described it almost exactly like the TV show. And the skeptics go, hey, 
all right, if he's describing the aliens that he saw nine days earlier in this TV show in hypnosis and saying it's, it's real, it's clearly not real, it's clearly influenced by TV, therefore let's throw away everything as just fantasy. Um, I, I take a different take on it because I go, if, if it's all dreamlike, some part of it's definitely involved the subconscious. There's no way around it. And the fact that it, the reports are in the, especially hypnosis talking about imagined things, doesn't mean it's not real or there's something underlying it that is a real interaction. Um, but I would agree with you in terms of being very discerning about the media one consumes about this. That's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm talking about this is because I see the media from the 1990s and 2000s being really impactful about people. These experiences, there's a, it seems to me that there is an extraordinary phenomenon of contact, like Bledsoe is a great example, but it happens sometimes in dreams or dreamlike states of consciousness, trance and other things. And it responds to your expectations. So if you're expecting something scary, it will kind of be scary. And that's how dreams sort of work a little bit as well. And so I think, God, like what would happen if we cleared away a lot of the fear around that and sort of started talking about your, your you're not a victim in the experience. You you could be empowered. You could navigate it. Um, that's that's really what in, inspires me in terms of talking about why it's imaginative. Yeah, sure. Let's talk about some geometry, like sacred geometry. Why it keeps showing up in our reality? Um, do you think that's the larger consciousness system trying to get our attention? Like, what about numbers? Right? Like, do you see like uh, pairs of numbers all the time? Could that be you know? Could that be a message from? The larger consciousness system or is that just due to chance like what are your thoughts yeah um i think a couple of things one is right if you start looking for numbers you'll find them so i think there are a million anomalies in this world and this is a, a thing if you're looking for an abduction experience in your life or whatever and you look for the signs you'll find the signs right like there's enough signs or enough anomalies out there in the world that we can justify a lot of kind of magical thinking around it so <clears throat> that's one level, right? Like you in, but I also think that even if, even if that's all it is, it's like you, you get primed to see 1111 and you say, Hey, that's meaningful to me. Then your subconscious goes, Oh, let's look at 1110 at the clock and see it turn to 1111. And that will be meaningful. That's self-communication between you and the world and back. So there's sort of a, um, a meaningful communication happening with yourself. But I also think, I mean, I think in general, um, and this, I would understand it mystically, is that the world itself has a sort of mathematical structure and it wants to communicate with us. And I think it's communicating all the time through numbers and geometry. And that if we want to tune into that frequency, it will then start guiding us to understand it more. Um, and I think that comes through a lot with a, the ET communications or, or other things. People People start tuning into the angel numbers and that's just it, I think they're sending these invitations out all the time and only those who really want to listen to it go, hey, there's something in here. They start tuning into that frequency and it's more, more starts coming out. Hmm. So what, which beings are you in communication with? Yeah, there's a, a, so I know that's a good question. I, I would say in general, my communications are mediated by my higher self. So that I say that, is how it sort of unfolds. That's how I understand it. So all of the beings I say I'm in communication with come through, generally, I think of as dream characters that may have some realness to them. Sometimes I think, oh, this is definitely an alien being in a, in a flying saucer craft, and he's beaming his thoughts to me. And sometimes I'm like, well, actually, this is more like a maybe there's a spirit guide behind there or something like that. Mm. Um, well, do you think it's your higher self just playing all the parts or do you think there's individual beings or energies that are like communicating to your point with your higher self to communicate a certain message i think it's a combination and i think oftentimes they use what is most energy efficient so sometimes a manifestation a communication in the physical of a light in the sky or whatever right oh my god that's a very powerful mode of communication because i go oh and it, it's mediated by my higher self, right? Like I would not have that experience. I would not be there unless I was called to. There's some sort of 
psychic thing happening. So I'm responding to it, but there's actually something out there physically. We could measure it with sensors and it would blow our scientific minds and it would be something different than this body. Um, regardless, it's still talking to that higher self element. This is what I believe. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that in it, that mode of communication is not energy efficient for daily modes of communication. It's so much energy to show up that way for, for these beings. And I think there's a lot of checks they do to make sure, right. You're not, they don't accidentally show up and blow someone else's mind that doesn't <laughs> need to be blown or whatever. So there's a lot of energy that goes into it. So then they, they go, Oh, what we can just show up in a synchronicity where they think a glint off of a, 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 an aircraft flying away that's a ufo and they can't the human can't understand it in the moment and they have this experience of miracle that's the same experience of miracle that they would have if a, a legitimate uap would show up and it doesn't matter because that's your lived experience and so it's much more energy efficient for them to just kind of coerce a synchronicity mm -hmm. yeah yeah i'll tell you one experience that i've had where i i i run daily uh, whether on a treadmill when it's colder or outside when it gets a little bit warmer. But uh, I've I've made it a, a point to, to to at least run at least outside twice, uh, regardless of the weather. And one morning I went to this this field and I was observing the, the, night, the night sky, stargazing. It's like 4.30 in the morning-ish, 5 o'clock, uh, 5.30. And I just simply set this intention of like, you know, if if you're with me, and I don't want to put a name on it, but if you are with me, uh, show me a sign. Like, am I on my path? Am I doing the right things? Are you here with me now? And immediately I see this, this star that wasn't there before light up, move, and then go out again. Right? Like to me, that's a meaningful experience because I put an intention out to the larger consciousness system asking for a sign or a, some type of communication back to me that I am not alone. And that happened. And I, people, skeptic, skeptics could say, oh, it was a flying, you know, shooting star or a satellite or something similar to that. But for me, I literally saw something that was not there, became there, and then moved and then disappeared. Um, and that was my physical reality. I know I wasn't dreaming. I was standing right there and I was having this, this communication with the larger consciousness, consciousness system. And how I take that is, I can move forward in my reality at any point in any given moment and make that intention and set it and then communicate with something that's larger than myself and know that it's going to respond to me in some shape or form. I just have to be open to that answer, right? Like I have to really pay attention in the moment to things around me, synchronicities, numbers or whatever to really, it, may be, it might not be as, I don't know, um, as salient as a, a star right? Coming out of nowhere and just dissolving, but it could be like something very small that I just take for granted. But what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that, that feels like a um, process of divination, right? So looking at omens and things like that. And so oftentimes that sense of divination, this sort of asking for a sign, that's, that's very similar to like dream incubation, right? So we, well, I need a sign from my dreams, go to sleep, you have a dream, and then you have to make sense of it. Sometimes the dream makes a lot of sense. Sometimes it's very powerful. Sometimes it's not. Uh, sometimes it's confusing. And so in that same way, it's like, universe, give me a sign. And you're out there. You're open. You've, you've put out that experience. And it, then whatever comes up is that sign in some way, shape, or form. And then you have to then go through this process of interpretation to, to make meaningful action from that sign. And so that, uh, that's really that. a, a sense of... Dream, like the dream incubation pra practice, and it shows that there is a connection between inside and outside. Then mm -hmm. now that that's a very clear principle associated with like hermetic thought or consciousness based thought. It is not the type of thought that scientists want. They want, I mean, objective scientists want. So it's a different mode of meaning making and knowing about the world. And I think it's equally as valid as science but it has its domain and i think as a society we need to be clear about what mode what mode of thinking we're using and knowing and we also need to elevate this sense of divination to be something as 
equally as important as objective science, but in a different different domain. Sure. Now I've heard something called E5, right? I don't know exactly 100% of what that is. Uh, maybe it's setting a, an intention like that and then getting a result um, that is something similar to what I described. Do you know what that is, E5? I think this, Dr. Stephen Greer has mentioned this before. Yeah, CE5 stands for Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. The Close Encounters is a UFO classification system from mm. the last century. So the first CE1 is like seeing a UFO. CE2 is getting some evidence. CE3 three is, I don't, I'm not sure what CE four is an abduction. CE five is human initiated contact experience. Stephen Greer popularized it through a series of documentaries and his work and his app and things like that. He based from my understanding, a lot of his work on the Rama network, R A M A or R A H M A, something like that. That's a Latin American contactee network. So they, these people, they got telepathic messages from UFO intelligences. They use automatic writing. They have these sort of spiritual practices, protocols. It's, it's a protocol to invoke contact. They see lights in the sky. They have interactions with, with light beings, I believe. And, and sometimes they describe other beings that I'm, I'm not sure if they're describing physical beings or not. But in general, the term we use now is human initiated contact experience, H-I-C-E, um, to distinguish it from just Stephen Greer's experience because he sort of had this like copyright trademark thing kind of defensiveness around it. So the HICE, human initiated contact experience is the um, term I'm using or, or we're using to look at that. And that again is a sort of an incubation experience. It's an invocation. It's exactly what you did. That is basically is show me a sign the intention might be let's make contact with another being for some purpose. And generally that purpose is spiritual elevation or benefit to humanity and that sort of thing. I love that. Daniel, man, I can talk to you for days. What, uh, how can people connect with you? How can they find your work? Yeah. Um, so if the dseti.org is the website, dseti dreams, uh, study of extraterrestrial intelligence. It's where you can get in contact with me to set up a free and no obligation consultation for DreamWork sessions to join. Uh, I have recurrent dream groups. So we share dreams. We talk about ET dreams. Uh, I love that group. It's just a blast. So um, uh, that's, a, that's an offering of that website. There's a lot of information around that. I do videos on my YouTube channel. And then the other thing I would promote is the DreamWell app. So dreamwellbewell.com. And it's on the app and play stores. And it talks about how to use mindfulness practice and dream practices and sleep hygiene just to elevate your lifestyle and, and, and have, a, have better sleep, dream well, be well. And so it has courses about mindfulness, sleep, and dreams, and also dream journals. So it really guides you through the practice of exploring dreams from a mindful perspective. So if it, anyone's sort of curious about dreaming, but not necessarily into the ET thing, that's a really great place to go. Love it, man. Daniel, bro, thank you for taking the time out of your early morning and connecting with us here on the show and talking about your experience and sharing the literature and, and, and your story, man. This has been awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.